Good evening. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we meet and we learn from each other tonight on country. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land where I live, work and write. I pay my sincere respect to Indigenous Elders past, present and emerging and I extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who might be with us here this evening. Good evening and welcome back for another season of History Matters. My name is Rachel Franks and I'm the Coordinator of Scholarship at the State Library of New South Wales. And one of the real treats of my job, you may have heard me say this before, is to work with people on the library's public programming, bringing great stories from the library's collections and further afield to you at home. So tonight it is a, a treat to be celebrating women's history and if you have any questions for our speakers this evening, please use the chat feature in Zoom. Your host this evening is Dr Janine Baker, who is a former fellow at the State Library of New South Wales. We're always quick to claim credit for a former fellow. And tonight she's representing the Professional Historians Association of Australia, which of course has been collaborating with Oral History in New South Wales to bring you this series, History Matters. Janine is too the author of this most excellent book. If you're looking for some great women's history to read in the month of International Women's Day, then um, try Janine's book on Australian women's war reporters if you haven't already. I'll now hand over to Janine. Thanks, Janine. Thank you so much, Rachel, for that very unexpected um, plug of my book. So hi everyone, um, I'm Janine. I'm thrilled to be chairing this discussion about women's history, which of course is a subject very close to my heart. Um, and on behalf of the Professional Historians Association, New South Wales and ACT, I'm, uh, I'd like to thank the library for um, working with us and Oral History New South Wales on this series. This is the third year that we've done History Matters. So we're very grateful for your support. We've got two fantastic speakers tonight. I'm so honoured to have both Dr Sophie Couchman and Martha Ansara to talk about their projects, which both focus on very different aspects of women's work. Um, so first up, I'd like to ask Sophie Couchman to talk about the wonderful Invisible Farmer project. Thank you, uh, Janine. I'll just share my screen. So I'm zooming in from the unceded lands of the Yalakut Willem clan of the Bunurong, uh, who are part of the Kulin Nation and the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on. First Nations women have and continue to make um, valuable, have valuable insights uh, into our land and its capacity for food production. And my experience on the Invisible Farmer Project has shown me um, that there's still much that we can learn from them. The Invisible Farmer Project was an ambitious three-year project that ran from 2017 through to 2020. Women, of course, have always farmed. Um, they've always worked on farm and farms and they've always played a significant part of the farming sector. But their significant contributions to agriculture and farming have often been rendered invisible in our own official records, our history books and our public stereotypes and perceptions associated with the, with the term Australian farmer. And these layers of invisibility are even deeper for, immigrant, for migrant and Indigenous women. The, this project sought to address this historical and contemporary invisibility and to celebrate the creative and vital role that women play in sustaining Australian farms and rural communities. The project combined personal narratives and academic research to map the diverse role women, of women in agriculture. It involved a nationwide partnership between rural communities academics, government, and cultural organisations.
I worked part-time on the project at Museums Victoria for about six months in 2019. My specialisation is Chinese Australian history, but I work very closely with individuals and communities. My key role on the project was to work with women, helping them to share their experiences via our social media platforms and on our blog. Despite my brief involvement with the project, it had a really profound impact on me and I count it as one of my career highlights. Not just because it's not every day that you get to install a cow pat in an exhibition display, but also because this project spoke to important and foundational issues. Women's place in society, food production and responses to climate change. And I felt like it was making a difference through the amplification of women's voices. Now, the blurb for this History Matters session talks about women's history bursting into the public domain. Now, of course, we've been seeing a much darker side of that happening in Parliament over the last few weeks. But what did this look like for the Invisible Farmer project? Well, here's Mom. She's a 16 year old Tasmanian. She didn't grow up on a farm, nor did any of her family have any connection to farming. But in pursuing her passion to become an advocate, but she's now pursuing a passion to become an advocate for the Tasmanian dairy industry. Mom's story shows innovation, passion and enthusiasm. Within 23 hours of posting her story on our Facebook page, it had reached 41,000 people. Interest continued and it reached a peak at around 60,000 people. Of course, over the course of our social media, um, over the course of our social media campaign, we had over 10,000 active followers and 2.3 million audience interactions across Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and our blog. In addition to social media, there was also high demand for print, radio, and television features about the project, invitations to present at national and international conferences, and government and industry events. An ABC Rural Initiative for the project received nearly 200 public submissions sharing the lives of ordinary and extraordinary women farmers. We found that people, men and women, were hungry to read about and engage with stories told by women about their farming experience. Our social media posts broke standard rules about keeping posts short. People still read them all the way through. The reach of these stories went beyond friends and family and beyond local communities. Comments on them show that these women became role models, mentors and advocates. We received the most engagement on posts written by farm women themselves that described the challenges and hardships of being a woman on the land. These posts were liked and shared because they were relevant because women could identify and see their own lives in these experiences. The accounts we collected and engagement with them demonstrated what a diverse experience being a farmer is and how women find their own ways of being farmers. This engagement that we received was heartfelt and meaningful. We received hundreds of testimonials reflecting on how the Invisible Farmer Project gave them confidence, encouraged them to make changes in their lives and educated them about issues such as sustainability and climate change. So how did we reach this point? Well, with the rest of this paper, what I wanna try and do is unpick some of the factors that I think helped us gain this level of public traction. To begin with, this project didn't come out of nowhere. It built on decades of close engagement with women on farms and the key figures in the rural women's movement. The project was preceded by a two year pilot project between Museums Victoria and the University of Melbourne in which Catherine Forge recorded oral history interviews with women involved in the rural women's movement of the 1980s and 1990s. In 2010, the Australian Women's Archives Project interviewed winners of ABC Radio's Australian Rural Women of the Year Award for their Brilliant Ideas and Huge Visions project. And in the mid 1990s, journalists 
Ros, journalist Ros Bowden recorded interviews with rural women for her book, Women of the Land. At around the same time, Margaret Alston was also drawing on rural women's own accounts to understand their contributions to agricultural industries, communities and families as part of her research on social work. At a similar time, in 1989, in her first curatorial role at Museums Victoria, Lisa Dale Hallett, a young curator with a farming background, worked on the installation of the first exhibitions at the Stockman's, note Men's, Hall of Fame in Longreach, Queensland. She started to question where the women were in the stories being told about the working lives of farmers. When she looked at Museum Victoria's highly significant agricultural collection, again, women's experiences were missing. To address this, she became involved in the Rural Women's Network and attended her first Victorian Women on Farms gathering in 1993. The outcome of this was the Women on Farms Gathering Collection, which was jointly curated by the museum and the women themselves as equal partners. Lisa spent the next three decades talking, but more importantly, listening to women in order to learn about and document their experiences on the land. She developed a curatorial approach that was deeply embedded and engaged with the communities she was seeking to understand. This meant that the guiding principles of the Invisible Farmer Project were developed together with key women's agricultural groups and advocates. This was a project that came out of the community as much as being a museum, university and government project. This meant that there were net networks to draw on for input, participants and support, but more than this, a community of trust had been developed that helped breach the urban-rural divide. Central to the project were women's voices, women sharing their experiences in their own words. Our most successful and powerful posts were first-person accounts. As part of the project, 50 to 60 oral history interviews were recorded with women across Australia by Catherine Forge, Nikki Henningham, Lisa Dale Hallett and two PhD students, Jessie Matheson and Laura Cody. Museums, and I just want to give a, a, a call out and thanks to Catherine and Nikki for speaking with me as part of preparing this paper. Museums Victoria also gathered photographs, ephemera and objects for its collection. Another remarkably successful strategy we used was sending out a short written questionnaire with five open-ended questions. This allowed us to reach across geographic boundaries within our budget. We received well-written and engaging responses that really only required quite a light edit. And again, I think it was about knowing the kinds of questions to ask. Talking with and listening to the women in this project involved understanding the complexity of the space embracing contradiction, contradictory positions and viewpoints. Our informants were everything from proud self-identifying feminists through to proud farmers' wives. Some women were desperate to tell their stories and then there were others who didn't think they had a story to tell. Our project sought to celebrate women's achievements, adaptability and creativity in agriculture and food production but we also wanted to bear witness to the much darker side of women's lives on farms, domestic violence and abuse, structural and casual racism and discrimination. These accounts were hard to listen to, but were a vital part of understanding rural women's lives. In order to fully embrace women's contribution to farming, we also had to look at farming differently. There are many activities that make a farm enterprise successful. Women's role on the land are really varied. They often wear many different hats. They work indoors, outdoors, off farm, on farm, and in a number of different capacities, some traditionally defined as male, but not all. 
social media and digital communication sat at the heart of the project's community engagement and storytelling. It allowed anyone to participate in sharing a story or taking part in the conversations that were raised by these stories. It allowed the project to reach wide and diverse audiences across Australia and even internationally. It helped us attract collaborators such as Rory Sullivan, a Harvard medical student who used her 12 month gap year to travel and work with Australian female farmers linked to the project. The profile generated by our social media attracted a constant stream of media coverage, which in turn built our social media following. We were also able to observe and learn from the conversations generated by our social media posts. The timing of our project in the uptake of social media and digital communication was also really important. More than ever before, rural women were using social media and online methods of communication to network and to talk with each other. The Invisible Farmer Project helped to consolidate an already growing movement of awareness, solidarity and, invis and visibility within women in rural communities. So to sum up, how did, how did um, Invisible Farmer achieve the community engagement and the profile that it did? Well, I think it was decades of deep engagement with the community, providing spaces for women to share their accounts in their own words, understanding the complexity of what it means to be a woman living on the land and taking advantage of the opportunities offered by the growth of social media and digital communications. Now I'm just going to finish up with some slides about why this project was and continues to be really important. Um, perhaps this is not something this audience needs, but we'll cover it anyway. Um, and then some stories from the women uh, within it. So we know that women create at least 48% of Australian farm income, but a screen grab of a Google search of Australian farmers shows this. And I counted in this screen grab 17 men, three women and one dog. Uh, this is slightly better outcome than three years ago when there were three dogs and two women. Women only legally got the right to identify as a farmer in 1994. I just found that quite extraordinary when I discovered that. Much of women's off-farm and unpaid work still continues to be largely undocumented, uncounted and unrecognised. Only 2.3% of CEOs in agriculture are women. And this, this compares to 17% in, in other industries. Dorothy Dunn is one of the many women who've contributed enormously to farming in Australia but whose story hasn't been widely told. Dorothy's life was irrevocably changed in 1977 when a bushfire killed her husband, destroyed her home and farm and half of the livestock. In the years that followed, she also endured farm accidents, the death of her parents and a nervous breakdown. She describes her experiences like this. After the fires, I asked the children if they wanted to stay and they said yes. So it was all systems go for us, but the community and bank, even my mother told me that women didn't run farms. I'd always thought of my work as just helping out on the farm. I loved it, but I didn't perceive of myself as a farmer. But nobody had ever told me previously that I couldn't do anything because I was a woman. I loved farming and I realised as time went by, I was doing exactly the same as before, only more of it. Dorothy's determination to continue to run the family farm got her through these tough years. In 1993, she became the first president of the Australian Women in Agriculture. In 1999, Dorothy was awarded the Order of Australia, acknowledging her efforts for greater recognition of Australian farm women, both in their, in their work on farm and their ability to participate at the decision-making level. Amy Reid of Crowther in New South Wales posted this on our Facebook page. I said to my 16 year old daughter the other day that I hope that by the time she has a daughter, 
that she will not have to be asked what her contribution to farming is. People won't assume that she'll move away and marry a farmer, but that she could stay and be, be considered a farmer in her own right. I hope that when she and her brother are standing side by side, that she isn't asked if he'll take over the farm. This is still a common question, even in this day and age, and my daughter has picked up that it doesn't seem like a fair question. Why can't she stay on the farm? And I'd like to finish now by mentioning Tori Simone. Tori is a proud Kaurau woman who has spent the last 15 years living and working as a stockwoman within the pastoral industry. She grew up around Brisbane, but her connection to country and her family are from Winton Channel country. She reflects on how her spiritual connection to country and the ancestors have helped her to navigate a path as a stockwoman. As well as being a stockwoman herself, Tori has also written her PhD thesis on the history of Aboriginal women in the Australian pastoral industry from the 1860s onwards. Her research shines a light on the vital contribution of Aboriginal women to the pastoral industry, their hard work, resourcefulness, and their passing of cultural knowledge down through the generations. Now, I'd like to encourage you all, perhaps not right now because we have our next speaker, um, but to go and browse and read the stories that have been shared by the women and featured in the Invisible Farmer project. Hear the voices of these women, learn about their lives, because I'm sure that you're bound to find something um, that surprises. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sophie. That was amazing to hear about that wonderful project and see all those photographs. So we're going to do questions for both speakers at the end. So please just type in your questions into the chat and I'll um, be able to read those out at the end. So now we have Martha Ansara, who is the consulting producer and archival researcher on Women of Steel. Thanks, Martha. I need to be... Um on camera yes which is it's the host has stopped it it says so somebody has to un make make me visible i don't think i can do that rachel can you or you should uh click on the three dots martha and it you should say it should say um start video Unmute? No, you're not muted, but if you click on the three, okay, I did, I you did are. Just got you. Go ahead. Okay. Just, I'm just blown away by Sophie's talk. What a brilliant project. Oh, uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just um, tell you what I've got to tell you. Um, I've been making films for a long time and several of these films are still in circulation, having, to my surprise, now become history. But today I'm talking about Women of Steel, a documentary completed in 2020, made as a history of the landmark Jobs for Women campaign, which took place in Wollongong between 1980 and 1994. And um, interestingly enough, many of the women involved still, to this day, don't speak English very well at all, which was you know, just interesting in making a film. Um, when the History Council of New South Wales gave the film an award, <laughs> it was great, as public history, I realized that of course, most history documentaries are just that, public histories, because they're meant to go out to the public. Um, you know, and that's a good part of it. Happily, these wonderful perceptive History Council judges describe Women of Steel this way. They said it was informative, gritty and evocative an important word, evocative, and an insightful interpretation of the subject matter using storytelling. That's another important word, storytelling, to encourage community engagement. Finally, they described the film as a powerful statement about the industrial landscape in Australia, where these issues still resonate today. And that again is important that they resonate today. And for me, this is a good definition of public history an interpretation of its subject matter through evocative storytelling, encouraging community engagement with issues that still resonate today. 
Um, Women of Steel was directed by Robin Murphy, a leading participant in the events the film documents. Robin had been working in film on the film for about eight years when I moved to a house in Port Kembla on Wodi Wodi country overlooking the steelworks and she asked me to look at the assembly of her footage and straight away I could see the authenticity derived from Robin's direct and deep knowledge of the events and the people who figure in this history as in Sophie's project. Um, and when I saw Robin herself on screen, I had confidence that the film would be good. And we're going to play a, uh, the trailer of the film. And I think you will be able to see why I encouraged Robin to become the on-screen guide into this history, which she didn't want to do, but she did. Um, popular stories on, on film often depend on an engaging central character for better or for worse. I mean, I like the idea that this big Farmer's Project was many characters. Well, of course, our film is too, but Robin's the last speaker in the trailer, which Janine will play in a second. But I'd like you to just take note of all the different kinds of footage in the trailer. So let's see if we can do it. <laughs> I'll do that for you now. Yeah, thanks. If people said you are going to fight against a giant, I don't, I don't care, I have to do it. BHP was the biggest, most powerful company in Australia. It had over 20,000 people. Migrant women wanted to work at the steelworks and they wanted a better future for themselves and their children. We were told there were no jobs for women. They were going to not give jobs for women, just men, men. But no work, no income. Well, that wasn't fair. Saying there's no jobs for women is, is discrimination. A lot of these jobs in BHP surely would be very difficult, dirty jobs. They're too fat, they're too small, they're too this, they're too that. They would not negotiate. Or one of them threw off the bridge because he was being very cheeky. <laughs> Company just denied discrimination. They don't have the skills. All these people have got the same type of face. It's not legal. It was very difficult for both parties to fully understand the other. And we have to say no. No, we wouldn't know how to speak English. The company did nothing. So we decided, right, we'll take it to them. I thought to myself, we're taking on a giant. We're trying to get jobs for women in the steel industry. Hundreds of women started turning up. Men say if women are Australia's longest running sexual discrimination case. Sexual discrimination. Sexual discrimination. The whole community march on the camera. We broke down the doors of Parliament House. <laughs> People were just blown away. One judge has referred to it as being as significant as the basic wage case. We've been working a long time. How many years? <laughs> The superintendent came out and he said, I hope you're not going to make any trouble. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, that was Robin at the end. And I hope it gives you a sense, although of course it's a trailer, of what the film is like and the evidence used to construct it. Oral history with those involved directly in the campaign, news footage, amateur movie footage, amateur and professional photographs, posters, newspaper headlines, and uh oh, recreations. Well, might you ask? Robin, the director as participant, provides a voice that constructs the story from her point of view and her analysis. And I believe that her clear authorship of the film helps give Women of Steel its, its direct character. She's been an activist for 50 years in the women's movement, trade unions and the left and left politics. In her 20s, she made a few short films before becoming a leader of the Jobs for Women campaign. She subsequently worked for 30 years in BHP's Port Kembla Steelworks as a welder, crane driver, hot strip mill operator and so on. And when she retired and 40 years after making her last film, she decided to produce Women of Steel. Um, every history I believe is constructed consciously or not from an impulse emanating from the author's present conditions, ambitions and ideology. And Robin has summarized our intentions in producing Women of Steel as quote, 
the determination to bring the collective voices and experiences of those involved in the campaign to viewers in a direct way without preaching. That is, it's not a didactic film. In order to also reveal the strategies which led to the campaign's victory and its important collective. She continues, the women of Steel's stars are not politicians nor celebrities nor figureheads of any kind, but working class women who stood up to a seemingly unbeatable foe. In this way, women of steel might inspire others who face some of the big problems which confront us today. And I'll add that of course the film does include such people as politicians and lawyers, but we're talking here about the film's point of view. Unusually for social documentaries, we were constructing our history from within the social class that we were portraying. And I should add, and it is unusual, and I should add that we were viewing this history not only from this social class, but also for the social class as well as for others. And it's interesting that the film is being shown in lots of places and, and you can book it now for a cinema near you. Um, and it's largely, um, yes, it's largely industrial workers who want to see it. To me, this, this um, is the power of my particular take on public history that it's from and to, you know, the class. But of course, I'm not suggesting for one moment that the subjects of public history must be drawn exclusively from one class or group, not at all. Or that public histories are necessarily written from a particular class perspective, not at all. Nor do I think that academically trained historians, as we have seen, are unable to create successful public histories from, as it were, within a different class viewpoint. Um, and I think I myself did so in making three of the old documentaries I mentioned at the beginning. They were made in 1978, 1989 and 1993 under the direction of grassroots Aboriginal activists, community people who persuaded me, somewhat reluctantly sometimes, to become involved. And my role as with Women of Steel was to contribute my training and expertise as faithfully as I could to the stories they wanted to tell from their perspectives. Importantly, I engaged in, and I, th I think Sophie mentioned this, not in these words, but in what I would call lowly listening, which also meant a lot of watching and looking. To be honest, these films are not very cinematic, but their collaborative method brings authentic voices to public awareness. And in the words of these wonderful History Prize judges, they still resonate today. I mean, after all, one of them's, you know, 1977, and the 1989 film was simulcast on ABC and NITV on the 26th of January. But again, not for one minute do I propose that collaboration is the only approach to public history. And then too, it has its own particular problems, believe me. Uh, but I want to say something about what in my experience distinguishes making a history film from um, writing a history book or any written work. Issues of subject matter and ideology are not that different in written work or, or making a film, nor is the process of researching the sources that provide the foundation of the project. You find the archives and of course, their previous undiscovered treasures that only you discovered. And if the history is recent enough, you find participants who hopefully want to talk to you. And when you've gathered all your evidence and you get a grip on your themes, you construct your narrative. But that's about all I can think of, which is the same. To begin with, in a film, you can only include what you can actually show in an informative and evocative way. Otherwise, you end up with, to me, a boring, teachy-preachy tract. Of course, plenty of documentaries, as you know, are like that. And many all too often are overburdened with what is known in documentary as a so-called voice of God narration, telling from on high the viewers all about what they don't see or experience on screen, in which case you might as well write a book. You'd do better. A history of on film absolutely requires visible evidence, well, and sound evidence too. And for recent histories, the most informative and invocative evidence is live action footage filmed at the time on the spot. But obviously we can't always find this footage. And I think you can see from the variety of material in the Women of Steel trailer, how we got around the gaps. Um, did you spot the historical recreation? <laughs> Desperate measures, I assure you, and I don't want to go into this here, but then most of the visible evidence in a film has special problems with the truth, frankly. 
uh, more so than in a book, I think. Then too, a history film is inevitably expensive. Just to give you some idea, the cost for archival and news footage these days is $88 a second. And the money just runs out the door. Of course, because of the community nature of the film, Women of Steel did get discounts and in-kind donations. But Australian film bodies do not invest in documentaries made by career steel workers, I assure you. So our only way forward was to solicit the necessary dosh from the public. Ultimately, this film was financed by over 500 individuals and organizations. And can you imagine the work involved in asking everyone you ever met for money? You wouldn't want to do it? Now imagine what a great way that is to recruit people to help get their history film to its audiences. Not bad. But for me, the high costs are not the most difficult issue in producing a history film. Compared with writing a history book, the real killer is the demands made on the text, if I can call it that, in the film's distribution and reception. Just to begin with, filmmakers must wrestle with the challenges presented by length. That is, what truths and what details we can and cannot include within a necessarily limited amount of time. And, you know, I mean, other people have gotten around it, like with Shoah, by making hours of film, and you can do that, but it's not going to get around to the people you want it to get around to. So there we are trying to engage our audiences by telling a well-structured story within the time that distribution constraints allow. And because of these constraints, the issue of truth, which in history more generally, at least to me is vexing enough, becomes explosive. No ifs, ands, or buts, no qualifications, no footnotes, no references, nothing. You just put it up there as if it's real. And the reception of a documentary is complicated and indeed I think compromised by the audiovisual nature of the medium. It's a rare documentary that tries to challenge the appearance of being an unmediated window into reality. But we do try, you know, people think that what they see is real because they're seeing it. Seeing is believing. A couple of minutes into Women of Steel, the director makes the self-reflexive declaration that she has picked up her camera to make a film about the great campaign she'd been involved in. So with this statement, she is telling us that what we're about to see is her subjective construct. But I doubt that this revelation has much effect, especially not compared to our more powerful attempts to create a narrative that is seamless, compelling, evocative, and purportedly the real story. As well, a film narrative happens over more or less unbroken time. You know, uh, with a book, you can stop and think. Anyway, and the historian filmmaker works like a demon to manipulate the viewing public smoothly over that time, working on the viewer's emotions to maintain their full attention. We are hell bent on creating a narrative that draws you in and sweeps you along right to the end. Um, and you know, that's a problem, I think. Even when the film is shown on a platform which allows for pauses to stop the film and think critically about what has just been presented, we don't want you to stop. We don't want to lose our grip on you. And, you know, we feel we've failed if you stop. Well, there's more I could say about all this, but I want to show you a clip, <laughs> which I think um, exemplifies what I appreciate about the film, this film and any film. And it's something which you may find dubious and controversial. But I think only in film can we use editing um, Editing, let me see. Oh, same page. Editing sound and image to express participants' emotions. What we live today is tomorrow's history. And the human heart lives today are chock a block with emotions. And I think that this is a very much a part of history. It's not usually included. And I ask you, can a book communicate the aspects of history which is expressed in the following clip? And um, I'm just going to end with this clip, and you'll see all the changes of mood. You know, you can't imagine how hard it is to make a sequence like this. But um, we take people up, down, up, down. Anyway, let's see it. Okay. Jules and we did, and, and we still do today. Uh, 
but we really thought that we'd actually had a fairly significant victory in winning jobs for women, but we were about to find out that the system was totally stacked against us. Only about eight months after some of us got our jobs, the company announced that they were closing their books. There wasn't any jobs for anyone. And so there was this fear because people started talking about, well, we're going to go, aren't we? We're going to go. We had heard that other industries outside the Illawarra were retrenching married women first. The effect was devastating across the whole community because BHP owned everything. They were sacking miners, they were sacking maritime workers. The government had to step in and bail them out to the tune of $350 million. Labor Council organised a district stoppage. That is, all of the unions of the Illawarra went down to the showground. We had a meeting, there were over 10,000 people. Someone had got up to raise the issue of married women should go. And Nando Lilly from the Federated Iron Workers Association got up straight away and said, there's only one form of membership in the union and it has nothing to do with whether you're married, single, male, female, black or white, whatever. We are we are that was the meeting where we then decided to march on Canberra. We We broke down the doors of Parliament House. I think it was the first and last time that's ever happened. I remember Donka saying, you know, she just couldn't stop crying. Their family had become dependent on, on the wage, which was a good wage. She kept crying a little bit, crying. Too much crying. George said to me, no crying. All right, worry, but no cry. <laughs> Nearly all of the women. All right. Yes. Um, sorry, the sound was in and out, and uh, the sound is a very strong part of the sequence, but that's the way it is. But you see, that this is this is what you can do in a film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, yeah. So anyway. I don't have anything more to say, but hopefully there's going to be some questions because film's actually quite dubious. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Martha. Yeah, um, I really love the film too. And I and that scene was incredible of the, um, bashing down the doors of Parliament House. So thanks for that very much. And so please everyone um, type your questions in the Q&A for either speaker. So um, I've got a couple of questions here for um, Sophie, which I might kind of wrap into one question. So um, Sophie, could you talk a bit more about how the project start um, was funded and also whether that funding is now finished and what happens to the all the material now and the websites and so on, is it being archived? So the Invisible Farmer project started with the pilot program, which was funded by a McCoy uh, seed funded project, um, 
bundle of money, which sits between, which is based at Melbourne University, I think, but it's for, to fund joint projects between Melbourne University and Museums Victoria. So they got a two year seed funded project and that's where they started doing the interviews and started doing the research. And the idea behind that funding is that you then put in um, for an ARC linkage project. And that's what funded then the three year uh, project. But the project also received funding from the MV McKay Charitable um, Trust, Highlands Foundation, Australian Women in Agriculture and Victorian Women's Trust. And there were lots of other organisations supporting with kind of in-kind um, contributions. Uh, the project itself has finished, um, but obviously the material that was created as part of the uh, project lives on. Um, the interviews that were done by Melbourne University are archived, uh, are held at the National Library and um, the museum ones uh, are at Melbourne Museum and will go up in their collections online. Uh, the Invisible Pro uh, Pharma website itself is a separate, uh, a separate entity, um, but it's also, it was down for a bit, <laughs> but it's up again. Um, and it is uh, actually archived by Trove website. I, uh, it's called Tro Trove Websites, but it's basically the National Library of Australia archiving program. So, so that the site is archived as part of that. And um, obviously all the social media, the Facebook um, stories, the Twitter stories, Instagram are all still there. And a lot of that, you know, a lot of those stories are embedded in that uh, um, social media. Um, and Melbourne Museum has been, in fact, during um, COVID, they've, they started a project called Collecting the Curve, and they actually went back to some of the farmers who were part of the Invisible Farmer project and looked at how they had adapted um, during COVID. And so those stories are up on, those stories have been kind of reworked and reinterpreted through that lens. And I think Museums Victoria will be doing that <laughs> with, with these stories um, kind of over time. So they'll continue to live. Great, thank you. So this is a question for Martha. Have the raw interviews been archived? Will they be accessible to researchers? Um, it's hard for me to answer that question. Robin is not, look, we didn't have a proper budget. Hmm. She has boxes full of archive material. I've told her where to take it. it she put it, she was working on the fire ground during the fires because she lives down the south coast and she was driving for three months. She was out of the film and driving a big truck, but she did and finally, you know, I would ring her every week and say, are they in, you know, take them somewhere, those boxes. She's not interested in archiving. What can I do? I'll shoot myself. <laughs> so no is the answer. Okay, not at this stage, perhaps further pressure. So what about the reactions to the film? Martha, can you talk a bit about- Oh my goodness. So whether there are differences, um, I, you have shown it in city as well as- um, we've, we've shown it, we've shown it. Wherever we can find a host, it's so easy to put it on through this thing called FanForce, which has demand screenings. And so there've been all kinds of screenings and um, I've been to just a few of them. Um, you know, we showed it at the, the National Film and Sound Archive, which are, the response is particularly from women, well, trade unionists go berserk, you know, screaming and laughing and shouting. And young women are really just blown away by it. Um, and we generally sell out our screenings. It's just, there, there's a big interest in it, except from the ABC and SBS. Go figure. Mm. Do, did you tell me that the that BHP were using? Oh, that's so amazing! BHP is showing it all around the world in their, you know, offices and factories all around the world because they have reformed, and I've even seen ads where they're advertising especially to get women into jobs. So it's going to have a massive audience amongst the BHP employees. That's quite commendable. Oh, of course. It, it was launched at the ACTO, there was an activist conference and it was launched online in November during the pandemic there. Mm. And it, yeah, it, it, I think it got the biggest audience. This is really interesting. 
it was a finalist in the um, Sydney Film Festival Documentary Awards. And I gather that it got the biggest number of people interested in it of all the documentaries. There was thousands. Mm. And of course they showed them in their lounge rooms to, to groups, I know this. So yeah, it's, but um, with a film, for many reasons, which I won't go into, you really need a TV sale and, and it's very difficult, not just for me, but for everybody who makes one-off documentaries at the moment. Thank you. Um, Sophie, I was wondering about um, finding, you know, given your also your special research interest in um, Chinese history, um, but also, you know, you mentioned briefly about um, migrant, you know, women farmers. Did, did you, were you surprised by the stories that came out about, um, you know, less traditional kind of ideas, you know, less traditional farmers, I suppose, women farmers? And did you have to hunt for those stories or did they kind of emerge willingly? Or can you talk about finding those stories? Yeah, so I think um, a lot of the, the sort of story gathering was very organic. So it kind of came from people suggesting people um, and moving in those directions. Uh, I know talking with Catherine Ford, she was the primary um, curator on Invisible Farmer, one of the things that she would have liked to have done more of was, would, was actually digging out some of those um, migrant stories and particularly First Nations stories because there's a huge, um, there's a huge story there, but it's also a lot of work to um, do that, the kind of co community work that you need to get those, to get those stories. Um, I think it was less a, my, the, the thing that surprised me was less than the, the migrant diverse, those kinds of, those kinds of stories, but more just the incredible diversity of ordinary farming and ordinary uh, women's lives. And I, I read a number of the interviews that um, Lisa Dale Hallett uh, recorded with women working in the Gulf country in Northern Australia. And it's quite incredible. Those, those farm, those stations are like little small towns um, and the, the, the women do everything. <laughs> and th there's a, there was a very strong thing that came out about also bringing community together in places like that because you know, they're, they're hundreds of kilometres from, from a town. When they get together, it's, it's very significant and those communities are actually very close. But it's through the volunteer barbecue and through these kinds of activities. Um, and women play a, a really important role in, in that community um, building and cohe cohesion of, of, of groups. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's where, that's where um, the, the surprise came from me mm -hmm. and just the yeah the different kinds of work that there is and thinking about um, how farm work is not I mean there's plenty of women sitting behind tractors but it's not just sitting behind a tractor it's who does all the finances um, a lot of farms don't just run on the, the farm income that they need mm -hmm. off, off farm income in, in order to survive so it's women doing the books for other for other businesses you know doing the marketing um yeah it's 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 the full it's the full range and i found that that diversity just fascinating um i'm i don't have a farming background i am born bred in a melbourne <laughs> um so it was really wonderful to get that to get that insight Great. And there's a question for you, Sophie, which is about the emotional side of your work. So you must have um, come across like quite a few kind of really moving stories. So how hard is it to personally deal with some of the stories that you heard? And I'm sure Martha would have something to say about that too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't have that experience because my engagement was I tended to be engaging with smaller stories that women were talking about, but um, speaking with both Lisa and both Nikki, um, they spoke with women in depth who had had deeply traumatic experiences. Nikki Hanningham is a really experienced oral historian. And she said to me in the middle of one of one interview, she went home and she said, I'm, she said to herself, I'm not sure I can keep going 
with this. Um, but she did, <laughs> um, like the good, the, the professional oral historian that she is. So, um, and, I, and I think that there's, you know, those stories are private. They're not necessarily for a social media, for a social media post. And they are there to be, you know, explored at, at the time that's appropriate to the person who, who shared them. Is that answering your question? Uh, I'm not sure. I think so. <laughs> but I, I think maybe there's a lesson there, though, about, um, when, especially on those big projects, about having support for the people doing, not just the, um, the people giving the stories to you, but support for the historians involved, the people gathering yeah. stories that you need to be supported as well. Would you say that's a fair? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I mean, the, the curators at um, Lisa, Lisa um, Dale Hallett, and I think even Catherine Forge at Museums Victoria uh, worked on a, um, a bushfire project. Um, and so the museum is, has mechanisms in place mm. for, you know, providing that kind of support because absolutely you, you, you know, you do need you do need it, and it's good to have colleagues around you to be able to talk through some of those some of those issues, and the you know the privacy and the sensitivity of how you talk about how you tell those stories, how you share, whether you share, yeah, um, and and that's yeah that's about talking with the women with the women themselves. Thanks, Abby. So. We've, uh, we've got to finish really soon. Martha, do you want to just respond to that as well about dealing with emotions? Because that could uh, yeah. Well, I'm by training a cinematographer and you just have to be tough. I remember I was filming a, a film called Violation about um, victims of rape. And I just remember looking through the eyepiece of the camera and the tears were just running down my face and the whole crew, which was women, were just crying and crying. But, eh, you know, you just move on. It's, it's part of the, the sort of culture. You know, there's no room for emotions and it's not good. But on the other hand, my daughter did, um, went through those bushfires. She did three podcasts for a community radio network about them and I don't think she's recovered yet, you know? No, I don't know, I can't say much. I, I think it's very... Um... But as a filmmaker, you want, you want those emotions on the screen. You want to draw out those emotional stories. Yes, well, yes, yes, but I think you have to be very careful because people, I don't think people understand often what they're getting into when they're on screen mm. or what the consequences are. So the ethics of all of that are very, very complex and, and difficult. I always, um, I always make sure that the people in the film see, see the film at a stage where if they don't like it, they can take it out. But then I've often not done a film See, this is it. Because I'm a cinematographer, I'm used to shooting films for other people. So I often shoot films for the people who are in the films. So that's a different thing. They, they make the decision. Mm -hmm. I will say this film that was shown on um, Survival Day, I've been doing a study guide and it's really, it's about people trying to protect a sacred site in the middle of Perth. And it's been pretty devastating actually to realise, to really realise after all these years what's there and what's been going on, even though I wrote a book about it. But it just still, it just, yeah, it can be strong, but oh, you don't make films unless you're really tough. That's all I can say. <laughs> Which is not good. I'm not saying it's good. Yeah. Mm. That's wonderful. I'm sorry, I have to draw it to a close. So there are still a couple more questions that we couldn't get to. So I'm really sorry for those people oh. that just posted questions, but um, we have to call it time. So I'm just really grateful to you both for um, talking about these really fascinating projects, both really important. And I think you will get a rush of people, um, you know, trying to watch the film hopefully and look at the website. So thank you again. 
Um, and to the audience, I hope that we see you next month for History Matters, which will be on Wednesday, the 7th of April, on the theme of community history with three wonderful speakers, Therese Sweeney, Jackie Schultz, and Lawrence Ryan. So we hope to see you then. So good night, everybody. Thanks again Bye, to everyone. for hosting.